Hi, my name is Angela Peacock. I am a, a subject of the film Medicating Normal, and I also volunteer doing outreach, and I host conversations like this one. This is our 22nd interview, and our guest today is David Healy. David is a professor of psychiatry at the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, but he's about to tell you about himself, so if you want to know more, just Google it. Um, he is also the author of Oh, I'll just let you go ahead, David, please. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I, um, we, we know David because we're just in love with all of his talks, his books, his research. Um, when I listen to him, I just get fired up. It, like he really um, just has that spirit of doing what's right and bringing attention to all these issues, even when they're uncomfortable. So I just appreciate your work. And before we get started, I just wanna say thank you from our community that you've just been a fierce advocate for so many of us. I think I've only been um, um, an advocate because of people like you. I've, I mean, it's meant that I've bumped into a bunch of people who really show me how things work. And, uh, you know, so I've, I've gained in the process. But let me take you guys back to where it all began. And um, I did medicine, be, and this is probably important to know. Uh, I did medicine probably for much the same reasons as most of the other people that I know did medicine which was, well, you want a bit of status. You want a job that gives you status and money and things like that. So it was not for caring reasons. You know, nobody that I've met actually was into medicine because they care about people. They just think, hey, I'm going to be paid well and it's going to be a comfortable job, okay? Uh, I was also vaguely thinking about going into, you know, the mental health field when I went into medicine first. And the reasons for that were a little bit different, but again, probably not a million miles away from a load of other people, which was in my case, I was trying to answer the most important question in the world. What makes girls think the way they do? Basically? Really? <laughs> okay. So now, by accident, in the middle of all this, um, before I sort of qualified, I ended up doing some research and I went to a lab, which is over in the west of Ireland. And at that time, they were fiddling around with serotonin. Okay. And this was before we got the SSRIs. This was before Prozac and things like that. So there was a chance to work on it and do some research on people who are depressed and see what happened at the serotonin when you tried to treat them and things like this. And uh, because of that, I ended up with a few of the companies making the drugs that we now know as the SSRIs. They began to visit the lab and they began to talk to people like me and the other people there in the lab. And you learned a lot about what was actually going on, which was, they figured, well, SSRIs are pretty poor drugs compared with the older antidepressants, that if we run clinical trials, the older drugs beat the SSRIs easily. And, uh, you know, it's not obvious to us that there's going to be a market for these drugs. But then you began to realize that even though they thought that drugs weren't all that great and came with problems, that they still thought they'd be able to sell them. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing for me, and the interesting thing I think for you maybe as well, is that because I was one of the few people around the place who knew a little bit about serotonin, whereas the average doctor didn't, they figured that I was the kind of person that you know, the pharmaceutical companies could put me out there to talk to a bunch of doctors, to educate them and things like that about the SSRIs. And educate didn't mean repeating the idea that these drugs are weak and useless and you shouldn't use them. It meant letting people know about serotonin, okay? So um, that meant that I got to see things from the inside a bit, okay? Uh, you could see that uh, the pharmaceutical industry had begun to say things about lowered serotonin levels and it's the happy chemical and things like this. And if you knew a bit about serotonin, at least if you knew a bit about the things that we thought we knew then, this was all um, gobbledygook. This was biobabble, uh, as I began to call it. You know, it wasn't anything to do with the science. It was, it was, it was just loose talk. And the oddity was the doctors that I'd lectured to about all this didn't really ask any awkward questions. They just lapped it up and they repeated the same stuff to the patients that they gave the pills to. And you began thinking, well, you know, this is, this is all very loose kind of stuff, okay? But the other thing was, uh, well, it was a good way to see how you know, the pharmaceutical industry worked and um, things like that. And it introduced me to a few things that played a part later on, which was that uh, getting involved in meetings for the pharmaceutical industry, that I'd be asked the meeting and I'd say, yes, I'm happy to go along to this meeting and things like that. And um, 
they'd email me then later on and say, well, look, you know, what we want is at the end of the meeting, we want a few articles to come out of this meeting, which will get published in a reasonably good journal or whatever. And I'd say, fine, I'm happy to write uh, an article. And then, but you know, the next email would turn up, which had my article in it. They'd written the article. Now, the extraordinary thing about it was this, that you could take a bunch of Healy articles, <clears throat> you know, and lay them out on at the table and get a bunch of people that knew me well and ask them to pick out the real Healy articles from the ones that were not written by Healy. And there's no way they'd be able to do it. I mean, the articles that were written for me referenced my work and said the kinds of things that I say and things like that. It was, it was kind of... Creepy. It was a bit like meeting your double kind of thing. Wow. Okay? So um, every so often, I mean, well, not every so often, when this, when this actually happened first, um, I um, said to the company, look, well, when I agreed to get involved in this, I was happy to write my own article. So I'm going to go ahead and write my own article. And their response was, well, this is a bit unusual, but fine, okay. And um, um, when I did, they said, oh, yes, this is, this is actually quite good. But there were some important commercial points we had in the previous article. And what we're going to do is we're going to get someone, we're going to put someone else's name on the other article. Now, what they did with the other article is they didn't change a thing. I mean, I've still got all this. They didn't change a thing, but they put the name of the professor of psychiatry from Vienna on mm -hmm the other article that I'm thinking about now. And, you know, um, when you think Freud came from Vienna, it kind of gives you a feeling that, well, Vienna's come down in the world a lot, yeah. okay? <laughs> the other thing was later on, uh, I had a chance to do the same kind of thing, to say, well, okay, I'm going to take your article, but I'm just going to change a few little bits in it, okay? And you can change a few little bits on the lines of saying something about, well, we know that antidepressants can cause people to become suicidal. Checking, I mean, you know, I've been told you can do whatever you want. Here's the article that we've written. You can change it whatever way you want. And then you'd find, of course, if you put a thing like this into it, well, no, you couldn't change it whatever way you wow. want. So wow. anyway, way back um, when the SSRIs came out first, one of the thing, well, I mean, given that I knew a bit about how these drugs worked and had been teaching people about them and things like that, you know, I thought, well, hey, I have to give these drugs to a few people as well, just to see what happens in real life, okay? Wow. And reasonably early on, after they came out in the UK, which is, uh, uh, which is actually where I was then, um, I had two people who became suicidal, wow. okay? Um, they'd gone on Prozac, they become suicidal, you hold the drug, the thing cleared up, you put them on Prozac again and things, uh, they actually became suicidal again, okay? So, um, you know, I wrote it up and uh, wrote up the cases and said, look, it looks like these drugs maybe can cause some people to become suicidal, okay? Now, around the time that this happened to me, the article, the, there was a reasonably famous article by three people from Harvard called Taisha, Glad, and Co. And it came out and said, look, we've had six cases of people going on Prozac and they've become suicidal, okay? Uh, and I know I was asked by one of the people that I know quite well in the field, uh, what did I make of this article that had just come out saying Prozac can cause people to become suicidal? I said, yep, I think that's true. I've seen just the same kind of thing, okay? So I wrote the article up and um, what, was, what actually happened then was interesting which was rather than the pharmaceutical industry sort of saying, you know, oh, Healy's an awkward customer, we need to try and sort him out. All of a sudden I get an invitation to become a consultant for Eli Lilly. Wow. And being a consultant meant, you know, I got first class train down to London to meet a group of colleagues in the most expensive hotel in London, taken out for a meal with them all and, you know, meeting people from you know, the pharmaceutical company who were, extraordinarily friendly and you know became your best friends and they knew what you did and they knew your children's names and you know they were really nice people and uh, you know what um after you've been out for the meal and all you sort of go 
back to the hotel and the next day you'd be with them in at the company headquarters seated around a table 10 or 12 people and in theory the idea was they were just trying to find out what we all thought about the field and things like that you know but and they were offering a few gifts like uh, we can give you some media training so if issues come up and you know, the media get in touch with you you'll know how to handle them and things like that okay but they didn't really want to find out much from us. They wanted us to become friends and to be the kind of people who'd talk in meetings and handle issues for them. Or if the media were concerned about things, you know, that, um, that they'd have people who didn't look like they were company people to go to. Wow. And, you know, because it's hard work to get media training and to be treated like an expert and things like that, they had to pay us and they had to pay us well to do all this work as well. So, okay, so um, didn't actually stop there. Later on, uh, I was at a different meeting and um, this kind of thing gets a little unusual thinking back about it. Um, I was at a different meeting. I think I probably talked about um, Prozac causing people uh, you know, to become suicidal. And uh, again, the industry didn't seem to be too upset at me doing this then um but later on that evening i'd come back up to my room in the hotel and um one of the well one of the people working for um one of the companies appears at my hotel room door okay and she's an attractive woman and she's fit and she's tanned and she's not wearing a huge amount of clothes and she's holding a tray which has got a bottle of champagne and two glasses on it Wow. And, you know, is about to ask yourself in. And um, so I kind of, you know, say no. And uh, But anyway, this is the kind of thing that can happen. It's all about getting you on side. And I think at this stage, industry didn't quite know what to make of me, whether I was a friend or a foe or whatever, you know. But it, it um, sounds a lot, David, like they're grooming you, almost like a child molester would groom a kid do you know what i mean like well, let me butter you up i mean all that thing is all those things are influencing you whether you believe it or not even a tasty sandwich can influence you you know no no of course it can but it, it it's more a case of um making friends and it's hard for you to kind of do nasty things to your friends okay now things change slightly um when i ultimately ended up a few years later uh opting to become an expert witness in a case involving Prozac uh, and a man who'd gone to kill himself and kill his wife, okay? Wow. Now, one of the extraordinary things about that was uh, the legal firm who were taking the case for you know, the man's kids uh, had found it impossible to get an expert witness in the United States. So they'd come across the article that, that I'd written about Prozac causing people to become suicidal and they reached out to me and I said, you know, hey, I'm, happy to have a look at this and when I did have a look at it uh, it seemed awfully clear to me that there was no other way to explain what had happened other than this man had uh, gone on Prozac and roughly 10 days later killed himself and killed his wife and you know the cop that turned up at the scene said he'd never seen so much blood in his wow. life okay wow. so anyway um this case ended up going to court okay uh, and it was after that that things changed vis-a-vis the industry and me okay and a short while later after that I um and they changed both for the bad and for the good um I ended up getting a job at the University of Toronto okay and uh, I was just about to move over and I was um in the job of trying to interview people who were going to be working on my team and looking at where to buy a house and looking at where the kids were going to go to school and things like that and the university put on a meeting which was uh, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the mental health service in the area and the, oh, the 75th anniversary of the University Department of Psychiatry. And this was, this was um, the year 2000, okay? And uh, they asked me along to give a talk and there was a distinguished bunch of people on uh, the program who were all giving talks about various aspects of it. And one of the oddities is that at the end of the day, people were asked to rate the talks, okay? And um, most people rated the talk that I gave as being the best. And it was an overview of the field, you know, just where we'd come from and where the drugs had come from and what the key issues were, okay? And um, 
in the middle of it, I said, look, you know, there's a big issue here. I've been a, an expert witness and I've got to see things that the rest of you haven't seen. Now, I believe SSRIs can cause people to become suicidal and most of you here in the room probably don't believe that. But part of the reason is I've seen things that you haven't seen. Okay, and if you know, if we're actually going to resolve this, we all need to be able to look at the same stuff. Okay, so I didn't force anyone to think the same way as me. I just said there's an issue that we can't access the data. Okay, later that evening, I found out that in essence, I was going to be fired. I mean, I'd been hired, but I was now going to be fired. Okay, and uh, it's an interesting one to try and work out quite what happened. I mean, which of the companies were behind it all, because one of the key issues at this point was that um, I was involved in a different case, which is a man who uh, had gone on Paxil, okay? And 48 hours after he'd gone on Paxil, uh, he'd, um, he'd shot his wife three times in the head, shot his daughter three times in the head, shot his granddaughter three times in the head before he killed himself. Wow. Okay? And um, this was in, I think, Cheyenne was where they had the trial. But ultimately, you know, this isn't a bunch of people who are, um, who, who are left wing and liberals and things like that. This is, you know, solid people who are not inclined to let people off the hook for things that happen, but they blame the pharmaceutical company. Okay. Wow. Uh, in the middle of all this, I mean, the me actually getting fired was a few months before I was due to be, act, uh, to be the expert witness in this case. So I had no option but to, well, I mean, I figured I had no option but to go out there and tell the media, look, I've been fired by the University of Toronto, okay? And GSK, who were you know, the company involved in uh, the case, then filed with the court for saying, we don't want this court case to involve anything to do with Haiti and the University of Toronto. My thinking had been that, well, if I didn't do that, the first question on the witness stand would have been, well, haven't you just been fired by the University of Toronto? Um, right. you know, so, right. so the good side to all this was being an expert witness was you got into uh, the, uh, um, the archives of you know, the pharmaceutical companies, GSK, Pfizer, Lilly, and things like this. And you got to see things that were interesting. You got to see uh, the contracts between the companies and the ghostwriting agencies who are going to ghostwrite all the articles on these drugs. And, you know, wow. one of the things there is that pretty well the entire literature on any of the SSRIs or the antipsychotics and the cardiac drugs and things like that as well is ghostwritten these days. It's not written by the professor psychiatry in Harvard and Yale, whose name may be on the authorship line, they get paid for having the name of the authorship line, but they haven't written it. But and I have to stop you there because in college, that's called plagiarism. Yeah, well, it's not exactly sure what the best word for it is, but I don't <laughs> it, it is an interesting one, which is that in 2004, New York State took an action against GSK for an article just like this that had great academic authors on it, but it had been written by a ghostwriter. Wait, and wait, wait, David, so, hold on. We're having some kind of technical difficulty. Uh -oh. Okay. Hold on a second. I don't know what happened, but everything looks fine on my end. Uh oh. It says live. It says live well, as well. I think we're doing fine. Can you all let me know if everybody still see me? I think so. I I don't understand. Hold on. No, it's okay. Sorry. It was Nicole's side ended. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Okay. Pick back up for where you are. I'm sorry. Okay. So in 2004, New York State took an action against GSK for an article just like this that had a bunch of academic authors on it from the best universities and things like that. Uh, but in actual fact, the article had been written by a ghostwriter called Sally Layton. Now, New York State took a fraud action because the article had said this drug works wonderfully well and is completely safe. But in actual fact, when you got to see the raw data, it doesn't work and wasn't safe. OK, the other interesting thing was when GSK sent the data into FDA, they said, of course, you know, when you see this data, you're going to realize that 
our drug didn't work in this trial, but we don't think it would be a good idea to let the world know this. And FDA approved the drug and said, we agree with you, we won't let the world know that this drug doesn't work for children. You know, so it's an extraordinary situation. But one of the, as I say, so being involved as an expert witness um, has its tricky side, you, you get fired, but it has its good side, which is you get to see how things are really working behind the scenes. And uh, you realize that, well, I mean, you end up realizing that the people who come along to you know, the doctors who say, look, I'm on this drug and it's causing this, this, and this, they're the people who know what's going on. The doctor who's reading the articles in the best journals and looking at the guidelines, it's a fake literature. And if they're depending on these kind of things, they're really out of touch with what the drugs are actually doing, okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so let's, that leads us to our first question. I think, um, me, I'm worried about the prescribing rates of antidepressants. You know, there's a lot of harm that's happening, suicide, withdrawal states, tolerance, lives are ruined, you know, marriages fall apart. And during the pandemic, it's been raising like 30 to 40%. So all these people are getting on psychiatric drugs to deal with, you know, anxiety and depression from being isolated and being on lockdown. Um, and then it, it almost feels like these problems are getting worse because we have anti-stigma campaigns, you know, then people say you're pill shaming. Um, so in all your decades of watching this, have, do you think it's getting worse? Are we getting any better? What's your opinion on that? My view is that things are actually getting worse. Um, they're a lot worse now than they used to be. Um, doctors haven't ever been wonderful people okay but they do even though they've gone into the job uh, you know to make money and to um, kind of have status and things like that after a while when they're de dealing with a bunch of people who were ill a lot of them did become a bit more human okay and sort of did the right thing from time to time that's not the way things are now um they don't learn from the patients that come to them the way they once did they now figure, well, there's evidence-based medicine and we're supposed to be going by what the clinical trials say. And uh, if you come along and say something that's not e seemingly in the clinical trial, well, that means there's something wrong with you, not the evidence. You know, this, this, wow. this, this must be all in your head, basically. So they've, they don't see us the way they used to. They don't listen to us the way they used to. They don't learn from meeting us the way they used to. Uh, they're going by a fake literature. And the worry is, you know, to some extent, I mean, it's, you know, for me, and I'm still one of them, I'm still a doctor. And the worry is we're going to go out of business because if mm -hmm. the pills work so wonderfully well and are so free of problems, well, doctors are expensive prescribers. Nurses can prescribe these things, pharmacists can prescribe these things, and soon the robot will be able to prescribe them. We don't need expensive prescribers like doctors. So if we're going to stay in business, we've got to change the message, which to be more like, well, look, I mean, which is the old sound message, which was drugs are poisons. Mm -hmm. You can bring good out of the use of a poison, but only if you remember that you're giving a poison. And if you tell the person who's getting put on the drug, look, you know, this is a poison. We're trying to bring good out of it, but we'll only do it provided you know that's what we're doing. And also provided you keep an eye out for any hint that you may be about to get poisoned, okay? Mm. Uh, instead, they've become sacraments, uh, which is um, something that can only do good, okay? Mm. Um, and that's not what they are. You know, it's um, even at the Catholic Church these days recognizes that the Eucharist, well, we've got to have gluten-free Eucharist or the Eucharist can cause problems. But alcohol-free wine, right. Doctors <laughs> these days don't recognize that. They figure these things can only do good. And um, the evidence base, you know, if you think about it, um, they're there, for, I mean, one of the big problems is this, which is, um, Doctors generally, and it isn't just them, it's all of us, okay? We like techniques, you know, the latest iPhone, the latest computer, the latest thing that works. We're all for it, okay? Now, doctors have two 
gadgets that they're you know hooked to well more than two but there's one group which is the rct that's the randomized controlled trial which is really a gadget and doctors have been told this is the gadget that tells you what a drug really does okay but in actual fact you know uh, the gadget is mostly used by the pharmaceutical companies to get the message or to get the results that they want which is to show that this drug can be used to treat people who are depressed but Everybody assumes, doctors assume, you assume, that the fact that the drug seems to help your mood, that this is the single commonest thing it's doing. When in actual fact, um, this gadget, the RCT, misses the fact that uh, the commonest thing these drugs do is they impair your ability to make love. Within 30 minutes of the first pill, you'll be to a degree genitally numb, and the control trials miss this completely. You know, so they, rather than listening to us and things like that, they prefer to turn to brain scans and things like that to see the brain. And clinically, this is useless. There's very, very few cases where if I do a brain scan of anyone that comes to see me, that I'm going to pick up anything useful. When in actual fact, if I just sit and look at you, for instance, or you look at me, well, the skin I can see in you and you can see in me, we know almost nothing about our skin. You know, a lot of the neurotransmitters, so-called, are in our skin. The SSRIs do more to our skin than they do to our brain. Wow. Uh, but we're not looking at this. We're not listening to it. I'm not asking you about it. You know, if you talk about the fact that on these drugs, I've got burning, itchy skin, well, I kind of pay no heed to it. But in actual fact, I should be thinking, hey, this is, this is, this is interesting. This is telling me more about how people are the way they are and why, you know, people are attracted to each other or not, you know, um, this should be where the interest lies and we should be working together. Mm -hmm. And one of the so, problems, with, I think, just quickly, well, one of the problems for doctors in all this, I think, is they're living a lie to a degree, okay? They're focused on the RCTs, they're focused on you know, the brain scans, and somewhere, though, in them, they recognize that you come to them that you're distressed and they're not really getting to grips with this so they're feeling you know each time you come into the room there's this word about the heart sink patient okay they're figuring that you know hey it's a very stressful job i've got a hundred heart sink patients to deal with when they should be figuring well look and she's just come into the room she's a bright woman she's on this strange drug and She's maybe saying it's doing this to her and that to her, which isn't in the evidence base. Hey, I should be recruiting her as my new free research assistant. Right. You know, that, and instead of having 100 heart sink patients, I should have 100 free researchers, and the job should be fun. Fun's not quite the right word, but you know, it should be interesting that, you know, this is how we find out how people work and how the world works. Right. So, so what you're talking about in a general way is really medical groupthink, and we have we have come across this in the screening of the film Medicating Normal, in that for you know in in general most people are very receptive. They see themselves in it. They see their own stories. They say, "Oh my God, that's what happened to my aunt or my niece." But there's a small, select, very very few medical professionals that are like, "No, this doesn't happen. There's no such thing as withdrawal." The stories that you just saw are very rare. I actually had someone say that to my face. I could not believe it. And I, and I said to him, if it was rare, we wouldn't have to make a movie about it. Another time I said, if it was rare, NICE would not have changed their guidelines about antidepressant withdrawal. It's not rare. But anyway, so can you talk to me? Well, one more thing that when this happens, like in a screening or something, I want to talk to the person and say, you saw something that was uncomfortable to you. Can we talk about your discomfort? But you can't really do that in the setting of a screening. You know what I mean? So instead, you kind of get into this like defense, offense, an argument. And I don't want to have an argument because to me, there's no argument. I lived it. There's nothing to argue. You know what I mean? So, but this is cognitive dissonance and medical groupthink. So for the audience, can you tell them what is medical groupthink? How is it playing out and, and noticing all these problems that we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's a tricky question, um, and I'm going to venture into a tricky area here, okay? 
Just in uh, the news here in uh, the last week, there was a big scandal about a week ago, and uh, the Pope was asked to get involved. There was a school in British Columbia, I think, which was a residential school where the children of Indigenous First Nation people had been brought when they were young, and you know, the school had been operating for nearly 100 years. And um, at some point, uh, they found just in uh, last week or two that there was some graves there that they hadn't known about. And apparently, it looks like there's something like 275 children buried there. Wow. And this is not uncommon. This used to happen a lot. Okay. And uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has called on the Pope to apologize for the fact that you know, the Catholic Church was involved in helping run a bunch of these residential schools, okay? Now, I'm Irish and Catholic background, and I've got a great deal of sympathy for Orthodox Catholics and Orthodox Muslims and Orthodox Jews and things like this. There's a belief system that can do a great deal of good in all of these cases. But there's also, you know, when they run up against First Nations and people like that, they figure, well, these are primitive people and things like that. We need to sort them out. We need to bring the, the truths of you know, the modern world, civilization to these people, okay? It's a bit of the way the English used to view the Irish. They used to view the Irish as pretty primitive and they needed to bring civilization and culture to us, okay? But the other angle on this is that what we recognize as well, but it, uh, well, what to a degree we recognize is that First Nations people knew the area in which they lived. They knew how nature worked. They knew how, you know, uh, they had a bunch of kind of customs which worked in the situation they were in. They had local knowledge, okay? And in one sense, we think this is great. It's good to be in touch with nature, to have local knowledge and things like that. And I think that's a little bit what's happening here, which is when you go on a pill or when any, any, any of the people tuned into uh, the program here go on a pill, they've got local knowledge. They've got First Nations type knowledge, but we've got something like the Catholic Church these days, and it's a religious belief system, which is saying, well, well no, we know the truth. And, you know, <sighs> we're going to stamp out your way of thinking. It's a kind of cultural genocide wow. type thing. And that's getting worse, okay? A lot of doctors, you know, they're not ill-meaning. They, but I mean, they really do think they're bringing the evidence, the truth of what we know about these drugs to people like you who just don't see things right. And you need to be helped one way or the other. Now, one way or the other can get pretty extreme at times. You know, yeah. they can lock you up and they can do things to you. So that's, 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 it, it, it is a group think of the kind you see with religious believers who are overcommitted to the, to the, I mean, you can do great good believing that the world has a purpose and a meaning and things like that, but you've got to remain somehow Brotherly, as it were. You know, you can't think that you have the one truth and nobody else's view counts. And that's, I think, a little bit the problem we've got here. It's the medical system has become a religious belief system in a way that I don't think it was. Mm. And, and I keep thinking about this, so I might as well mention it. But you're talking about how the RCTs are kind of rigged a little bit. Like we know that that negative data will not be ever be published so they'll say like here's three pub here's three positive studies let's get the drug approved but then the papers are ghost written and then the evidence base looks like yes this drug works and so these well-meaning well-meaning doctors are reading what's in the journals that you know i get them in my email every single day and i'll scan them like jama what's new in psychiatry you know and i'll read quickly and they might read an abstract or two and on their lunch hour i don't know so what they think that they're reading is true evidence and what us as patients think our doctors are reading, so they're educated in the correct stuff. But it reminds me of like, it's all built on sand. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? And then I, in social work school, I kept, this kept coming up where we would read a study and I would say, okay, but 
are these patients that are getting CBT for depression? What medications are they on? I want to know that. I want to know, is this really CBT or is this CBT plus polypharmacy? I don't know that. So I can't say this is evidence-based because evidence-based for who, you know, and then even, even some of the evidence base is like all white males between 18 and 24 that are not suicidal. So of course it might look like the Zoloft is working because they're not having real world problems. They're not a, you know, a sample of people that are having serious issues. So what do you think about what I just said? Yeah. Yeah. Two quick things. One is that, um, yes, all the OCTs are done are ghost written. And yes, there's no access to the data. And these are huge problems. But even if the RC, I mean, one of the problems in the mix here I have, and one of the things that I come up against is the good people. Okay. That's the good people who think, well, RCTs are great if only the pharmaceutical industry weren't let to do them. My view is that RCTs are a problem even if the pharmaceutical industry don't do them, even if they're, done, if they're being done by good people, in that an RCT only looks at one thing a drug does, and drugs do a hundred things. Mm-hmm. So if you're focused in on just the one thing, you, you know, the, this issue about do they help mood, you can miss something that they do to every single person that takes the drug within half an hour of having had their first pill. You know, you just miss it, okay? But the other thing is, one of the um, things where I think we've gone wrong is this, that where, I mean, for years and years and years, I spent my time saying, look, you know, these articles are all ghostwritten and we need to take this into account. And there's no access to the clinical trial data and we need to have access to that. But here's the point. When I was asking for clinical trial data, I'm sure loads of people here listening in uh, say, you know, it'd be great to be able to get clinical trial data, but I'm no good at the figures, you know, um, you know, it's no point me having all this data and things that I won't be able to make sense of it. By data, however, I think I mean, you need access to the people who are in the trial. Let me explain. When you go into the company archives, there's all the data and you can spend your time if you're good at figures analyzing them and trying to work out what really went on. But actually, if you look at the records of the people that went into the trial and see, oh, if you just look at stuff like um, this person died in the trial, he died from burns. What you find out if you get his medical records, not the figure, or maybe if you get access to his wife afterwards, okay, you find, yep, he died from burns, but in actual fact, he poured petrol on himself five days before he died because he wanted to commit suicide because he felt so awful on this drug. But he didn't die there and then, he died five days later and he gets coded as burns. Now, the only way you find that out is if you can interview the people. I mean, in the case of a person who's dead, you can't interview him. But if you have the medical record, you can maybe work out what went on. And that's, that's what it means to do science. It's not about having lots of figures. It's about being able to check what the experiment showed. And that means in the case of a clinical trial, it means being able to interview people, you know, because you may be put on this drug and me looking at you, I'll just ask a bunch of questions that I've been told to ask, but I won't be asking about your sex life. You know, later on, if I'm interested in this and come back and can talk to you and say to you, look, they said you did great in this drug. How do you think you did? You might say to me, hey, it was terrible, you know, I couldn't make love to anyone or whatever, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, and that's our next subject, and we're getting close on time. Can you run a little bit over? Are you in a hurry to talk? Sure, so, absolutely, yeah. Because we have a lot of good questions, and they're all sex-focused, so I want to definitely hit them. I want to hit that topic next, but then also be able to answer some questions. Okay, so what you just said is, like, maybe these drugs appear to work in some people, but at what cost? Okay, so I am one that I thought my medication was working for many, many years. I was a compliant patient at what cost? The cost for me was sexual dysfunction. And I have not yet talked about this publicly. So this is very vulnerable for me to do. And it's hard, but literally kind of what happened was, I don't know when it happened exactly, but it was very soon after going on antidepressants and antipsychotics and sleep medicines and all these things were happening. And I would tell the prescriber, like, I don't, I feel like sex was erased from my brain. Like it was literally like, if there's an area of your brain that's responsible for sex, somebody took it out. I didn't think about it. I didn't want it. I didn't crave it. No sexual feelings, no 
you know, desire to like masturbate or date. And this is in the middle of my twenties. Okay. And I had already been married and I had a very active sex life and me and my husband had a great time, you know? So I knew what it was supposed to be. And now all of a sudden it's not. Okay. And so I told the prescriber that, and then they said, um, that's your trauma. That's because you experienced domestic violence. And I believe that. So I didn't seek it out. I didn't think the medication could, could possibly be causing that. Um, so anyway, that was my personal experience. So can you talk a little bit about, um, your work in this area with that post SSRI? It's actually post many medications can do Mm -hmm. this. Uh, just give us like a brief overview of kind of like your work, um, and what's going on with all that. Yeah, well, I guess, um, this comes back to, um, uh, I believe in patients, you know, and, um, um, the story that people got told early on with these drugs was that, uh, yes, they can, um, you know, they can um, affect a small number. Of, people like me were told, yes, you can say to your patients that this will actually affect a small number of people, you know, but if you need to go away and have a romantic weekend, you can stop your pills for the weekend and everything will be just fine. And people like me would say to patients, yes, you know, this is uh, the story. But one day I, I had a person come into me and I can still see her. Um, this was 20 years ago or more, uh, but I can still see her. And she was saying to me, look, I've got a problem making love on these drugs. And I said, yep, but it's the kind of thing that will clear up when you stop your pills. And or if need be, if you're going away for the weekend, you know, you can hold the pills. And she said, she looked at me and she said, well, you know, I've been off these pills for three months. And I thought to myself, oops. And she said, yes, and I can take a hard bristled brush and rub it up up and down my genitals and feel nothing, okay? So this woke me up. And the thing was, she was credible. She was again, um, woman who had done her own research on these things and uh, she was taking, Talapram, okay? And she'd looked it up and noticed that it was citalopram hydrobromide. And she'd done some research and said, and found, and this is true, that a hundred years ago, people used to give bromides to troops in the army to stop, to reduce their libido. Wow, I've heard of that. And she was saying, well, is it because of the bromide? So, you know, she clearly done her own research and the answer is no, it's not. Oh, it's tried it's Viagra and a bunch of things and just didn't help her. And as it turned out, I had more than one person within a few weeks uh, report the same kind of thing to me. And um, again, it, it's, it's something about um, just people when they come along are for the most part, to me, credible, okay? I mean, in you know, the job I'm doing, there's obviously going to be a few people from time to time whom you can't believe, they're trying to play the system, they're trying to get something out of the system. But for the most part, when people come into you and they seem decent people and they say things, uh, you know, I tend to believe them. And one of the things I've found out um, are one of uh, the patients I had uh, who many years ago, many, yeah, probably 10, 15 years ago, uh, she came in and reported that her SSRI had made her alcoholic. And again, I didn't believe this, but, you know, I've got a PhD in, in the serotonin system. And within a short while, this woman who had dropped out of school early, had no background in healthcare, made me aware that she knew more about the serotonin system than I did. And wow. she had worked out exactly how SSRIs can make you become alcoholic. And the other people who have come to the same view as her, the only other people around the place who come to the same view as her were the pharmaceutical companies who were working on drugs on the lines of the way she was thinking. And this led me to a phrase that I think is important, which is motivation is worth more than expertise. If you've got skin in the game, then you're, you know, you're motivated to search and maybe come up with some crazy ideas, but for the most part, you'll come up with pretty good ideas and people sift through these things and get a good handle on what could be going on. And this is where, as I say, my job should be much more interesting if I just listen to the people that come into me. But as regards sex then, it, you know, one of the mysteries here is uh, um, when risk.org, which is the thing that I'm involved in, um, got set up first in 2012, 
we expect it from people. I mean, this is a place where people can report the adverse events that are happening on pills to us. And we thought, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people who are taking SSRIs who will report becoming suicidal and report having sexual dysfunction. There was much more people reporting sexual dysfunction than people reporting becoming suicidal. But the next big surprise was that actually it wasn't just the people who are going on the pills and reporting that they're having a temporary problem. It was people who had come off the pills and were reporting to us that months or years later, they were still not functioning. And it's people from literally every country in the world, every ethnic group, old people, young people, men, women, et cetera, et cetera, on all of these drugs. And the other interesting thing is happens on ISO tretinoin for acne, and it can happen to young men who are taking Propecia for hair loss, okay? So the, the, this is a thing we should be able to answer, okay? Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's a, a Nobel Prize in here for the person that comes up with the answer in the sense that if we can take a drug for a brief period of time and it can have effects for months or years afterwards without you having to have the pill, that this is a bad effect in this case, but if we can work out how it's happening, maybe we can even do good things. Of course, mm. it won't be great for the pharmaceutical company because they want a model where we take the pill every single day and pay them money every single day. But at the same time, you know, you'd have to think there's a bunch of people out there who should figure this is an interesting problem and maybe I could win a Nobel Prize if I can answer it, you know? So the mystery to me is that we haven't been able to get more people interested. And, you know, I've been chasing the media on this for 10 years or more. And I thought sex, you know, the media don't want to talk about suicide, but sex, they'll definitely want to talk about this. They don't, you know, it's, it's, I it's don't. a big mystery. No, and I think, I, I think I've, I've personally avoided this topic because it's just so painful. And mm, to like, of course. It, you know, you lose your femininity and your sexuality in your mid twenties. You don't have children because you think this is my trauma, you know, like how fooled I was, but also kind of what you just said that like, I'm five and a half years off of all medication. I still have this very severely. So the hope, like it almost, it feels like the hope was sucked out of the room kind of when I realized like this could be permanent. And if you weren't suicidal before, when you realize that your sexuality and your, you know, we, it's in our genes to procreate, to feel sensual, to have touch and to like lose that, it will make you suicidal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've unfortunately had a bunch of people who uh, I know who've been in touch with me who have gone on to commit suicide. We've also had some people who recover. Now, at the moment, it looks to me like you know, the best thing is not to try too much stuff. There's a lot of people out there who are quite happy to biohack you, to sell all sorts of things to you, which is dangerous. I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a rough one to just hang on in there and endure. But there are a bunch of people whom I know of who have improved a lot and some have got the whole way back to normal, even though it can take a few years, so. Yeah, and your experience, cause I, I've noticed that too, like I'm part of some of the SS, PSSD groups on Facebook. And I do notice there's a pattern where people start to realize like kind of what happened to them. And then they start looking for a cure. And I always get scared for them because I think, wait, 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 like, that's the lesson that we all had to learn that there is no magic pill out there that's going to fix it whether it was depression or it's sexual dysfunction like what i know is the farther away people get from taking all these psychiatric drugs the more likely they are to recover rather than like taking and trying and supplements and new other drugs and all these things um sure but this is the here's um, a key point which is that you know at the end of the day we have to believe in each other we have to support each other but there's an awful temptation to think there is a technique or a trick or a magic bullet out there which is going to help us get by without the support of other people kind of yeah. thing you know mm. yeah. okay so i'm going to scan some of these questions uh you answered like many of them in that last little paragraph so let's see well there's one about very controversial topic about euthanasia of people, I know you've mentioned that in one of your talks about people that come off psychiatric drugs and have like horrible withdrawal syndromes and all these other problems that they go to Dignitas. Yeah. 
I don't know if you want to say anything. Just quickly, yeah, no, this is this is a real tricky area, which is um, there are, um, I mean, you know, it's a good thing to have the possibility to die when you choose to die. If you're going to be, I mean, if you're a, if you have an illness which is terminal and it's going to cause you a lot of suffering and things like that, that's a good thing. But the problem is, it's a slippery slope when you get a bunch of people who are often young women who have got what's been labeled as treatment resistant depression. Now that didn't exist before the SSRIs. It's only a thing that's recently appeared. And it looks to me like all the evidence is that you've been put on SSRIs and mood stabilizers thrown into the mix, you end up in four or five different pills. And the condition you have is a drug induced one Yes. for which there is no drug that we can give you to cure it okay and and people are told well this is your illness it's in your genes you're going to be like this for the rest of your life and they figure they can't live this way and they get medical assistance in dying which is grim you know if they are going to die i think they should have a look at the drugs that are on work out which is the one that will likely cause the problem and die by hunger strike outside the headquarters of the pharmaceutical company Wow. Yeah. I <laughs> like that. I know. Oh my God. I know. I was like, I can't kill myself. Like I have to stay and fight. Cause then I don't want them to get the last laugh. You know what I mean? Like, no, well, I, agree. I agree with you. But one of the important things, one of the important things here is, and, and again, this is one, what you're doing is great. And you may have work. I mean, you may have words to share with the people listening in, in here. This one, one of the things I think is totally appropriate in the circumstances for people who've got PSSD or treatment, resistant depression is to feel homicidal. That's not a sign of mental illness. That's a sign that you're normal, that you're terribly angry about the situation. Yeah, and um, one, of, one of the people who got PSSD out of isotretinone, there's a very famous case, the guy who uh, got put on isotretinone for acne by his doctor in Chicago went and shot the doctor. Uh, one of, one of the surprises is that people don't do that. I mean, I'm not saying people should do that. One of the surprises is that they almost don't. Um, one time when I was being interviewed by, uh, under oath by GSK, I was saying to them, look, if I worked for you guys, uh, I would check under my car every day that there wasn't a car bomb there. And I would be figuring that there's quite likely to be a growing number of people out there who are thinking, well, you know, if I'm going to die or whatever, I may as well take David Healy with me kind of thing, you know. Um, so there's, there, there has to be a more constructive way out of it, which is supporting each other to find the kinds of things that you've done, making medicating normal. We need to, you know, to be engaged in a thing like this that tries to get over to people that there must be a better way to do things than the way we're doing it now at the moment, okay, is you know, the kind of thing that can give people hope uh, and help them maybe endure until some of the problems that, you know, the medicines have caused clear up. Absolutely. But, Thank you. Uh, we do, do not have any more questions. I think you pretty, you pretty much nailed all of them in that uh, PSSD conversation. So do you want to go back to a question that I had about, I don't know, I was thinking about you, you, in one of your talks, you kind of described the Stockholm syndrome between like patients and doctors and doctors in the industry and I'm trying to tie that to sex, you know, and that when you go to your doctor and you tell them like, I'm having these sexual problems, they see that as like a symptom of your mental illness. It can't possibly be the drug, you know, I don't know. Can you tie these topics together maybe? Yeah, okay, yes. And um, there's a thing to say that I think is um, maybe useful as well. Stockholm syndrome comes about because in somewhere around 1974 or thereabouts, uh, this guy in, um, goes to rob one of uh, the major banks in uh, uh, actually Stockholm, okay? And uh, he goes into the bank and he has a gun or two and he holds four people hostage. And uh, the Swedish army come in and uh, surround the building and they're up on the roofs of the other buildings around it and guns aimed at the entrance of the bank and things like that. And um, after about four days or so, uh, the guy gives up and comes out. Uh, but the interesting thing was the media get hold of the four people who were being held hostage there and they interview them. And um, you know, they all say, well, look, he was a really nice guy and we actually believe in his cause and things like this. Um, I don't think he was just after money. He, um, he 
probably had um, had some cause, okay? And uh, the people being held hostage said, you know, he was a really nice guy and we believed in his cause and things like that. And, uh, you know, everybody was a little surprised. They thought all these people who have been caught in the bank were going to be pretty horrified and say awful things about this guy. But in actual fact, this is exactly what happens when you go to a doctor. You know, the doctor is the person who is your key to getting out of the place, getting out of the illness you're in and things like that. And if you get put in a drug and, you know, things are going wrong, you don't want to make, you, well, you feel you don't want to make your doctor unhappy because, uh, you know, when it comes to a crunch, you're going to need them and you want them to look favorably on you. And if you've been cranky and complaining and things like that, well, you know, he's maybe not going to help you the way uh, you may need to be helped, okay? Now, one of the interesting things, when we set up risk.org, and risk.org is a place where people can report um, the adverse events they're having on the pills that they're on, okay? And uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the things we thought was if people can write a risk report on what's happened to them on their pills and print it off, and it's actually designed to take you through a bunch of questions which will help you see if your pill has likely caused the problem or not, okay? So the idea then is you print this off and we had hoped that people would take it to their doctor and this would help them have a conversation about the issues that may be happening on their pills. We found that um, people instinctively figure if they try to talk to their doctor about these things, even with a report from an expert group like RISC, that he is going to get nasty. So yeah. We like to think of doctors being like Marcus Welby or George Clooney in ER. They're just nice people. They're not. We, you know, we may think they are on TV, but when it comes to the crunch, we figure they can get awfully nasty awfully quickly. And uh, they do. They ridicule. I mean, one of the interesting things about the SSD has been finding out how many people get ridiculed by their doctors, you know, really ridiculed, laughed at, you know. It's grim. Yeah, but it's, I was the, told. I was told to lose weight. They told me to lose weight, and then you'll, your sex will come back. It's, cool. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. But there's one more thing here that intrigues me a little bit, which is this: we talk about the fact that we've got these that we've destigmatized these illnesses. Okay, and um, you know that we used to think that being depressed was an awful thing, and you couldn't talk about it, and things like that. Uh, and one of the worries is it feels now that everybody feels free to talk about these things. And that's maybe part of the reason why we end up on more pills than maybe we should be on. But there's a further thing that came home to me a while ago. And this was listening to a friend of mine who's also a doctor and who was on antidepressants, okay? And one of the intriguing things is this, that, you know, if you're out for a meal or out in a group with a person who's got epilepsy, Okay, which used to be the classic stigmatized illness. You know, these people who would fall on the floor and froth and convulse. Everybody thought they were possessed by the devil. This was a real stigmatized illness. And if the person is there saying to you, you know, um, I've got epilepsy and I'm not taking any anticonvulsants, all of a sudden everybody will just, you know, freak. You know, hey, this is this is not comfortable. This guy might might just throw a convulsion, and that'd be terrible. Our AIDS, you know, if somebody comes along and says they've got AIDS and I'm not taking any, um, any pills for it, everybody will instantly freak and wonder whether they can shake hands with you or, you know, eat a meal with you or whatever. And the same way people who are depressed, when, when I mean, one of the things that happens, and it's a thing that um, maybe it happens more to women than men is when you say you're taking Prozac or an SSRI, you can feel people breathe a little bit more freely, okay? What's happening here is we don't stigmatize the illnesses as much as we do, partly because of the pills. Mm. When you're not taking the pills, all of a sudden the stigma comes back. Now, you know, you can handle epilepsy without pills if you don't get too fatigued. If you eat the right diet, if you look after yourself, there's a lot of people who don't need anticonvulsants. In the same way, handling moods and things like that, it, you know, we don't need pills for it, but somehow 
the pills somehow lift a curse. You're not cursed if you're taking pills. People feel you're showing that you're competent and you're a responsible person by taking the pills. When, you know, people go berserk on these drugs and kill others and do things that, you know, they would never do if they were leaving their illness untreated. Wow. That's fascinating that you just said that because this morning, one of the people in my group just brought it up that their spouse was saying like, are you off your pills? You didn't take your pills this morning. I can tell. And you're just mentally ill. Like, so it's almost like used as a weapon. Like you're not, you know, and I think that's a lot of fear from the patients where if you bring it to your doctor, they have so much power over you, you know, that what are they going to do to me? Are they going to stop prescribing? Are they going to put me in the hospital if I push back on what they're saying? You know, Mm -hmm. Mm. this is this is where you know, the world has changed so much in the sense of it used to i mean doctors weren't ever great people to relate to but there used to be much more of that relationship yeah. than there is now it used to be you know um the magic lay in me and part of the, the, of uh, the magic that i could bring to us was that i could give you a pill and we could see between us if it worked now the magic lies in the pill everything lies in the pill and i'm just the technician that kind of dishes these things out and gives out to you if you don't take your pills kind of thing but part of the problem is you as well have become accustomed to thinking the pills are the thing that counts rather than you know getting on with a different human being it doesn't have to be a doctor but just someone else who you know you can dance things back and forth with and and do some joint research with to work out well what's going to be the best thing for you right so there's there's a few more questions um i'm going to try to combine them for time's sure. sake but the general question or statement is kind of like when people are taking antidepressants there seems to be a numbing effect just in general like an adidonia i think i said that right you know you're just kind of emotionally blunt and I think this person is asking, like, is that relating to the sexual dysfunction? Is it just an overall numbing where everything is numbed? You know, how do those relate? Yeah, there's two different things. One is um, the on the SSRIs, a lot of people become emotionally numb, okay? And they become genitally numb also. Now, in some cases, you can get people becoming very genitally numb, profoundly gen genitally numb without becoming without having too much emotional numbness other people will have some genital changes but not marked but be profoundly emotionally numb so the two aren't the same thing but they're in the same ballpark and if we have the answer to one i think we'll have the answer to the other and i think the genital numbness is the one to chase because you know it's just a very small area of tissue if we can work out why this bit of tissue goes numb and stays numb afterwards, then, you know, that I think will be the answer to the emotional numbness also. Yeah. So for the last question, um, I always ask this when I meet people during the screenings and stuff, it's, you, you talked, you talked us through it a little bit. Like when you began as a psychiatrist, you started to kind of get these like intuitions, like, Hmm, something's not right here, but like, how did you learn about all of these problems and how did you come to like the work that you do today? Uh, well, I don't know. I think it began with trying to understand girls because um, women generally are tougher than men and more courageous than men. And, uh, you know, as I said, people are scared to tell doctors what's really going on, except if you're the mother of a child uh, or the daughter of a parent and you're concerned about them, then you will take on any doctor. And all of the interesting cases that have come my way have usually been boys or fathers or whatever dragged along by some woman who has hunted me down and said, look, can you have a look at this guy for me and tell me what's going on? And usually the woman's right, okay? She's wow. been told by lawyers or all sorts of other people, no, this is crazy, but she's absolutely right. Now, she, she doesn't usually do the same thing a, about a husband. If it's the case of a husband, she say he's a stupid idiot for not listening to the doctor. But when it comes to her children or her parents, then she, you know, you don't mess with a woman. The other thing, the other group of people you don't mess with is older women. The one group of people who will take it on themselves to talk about the problems they're having is um, an older kind of woman who is aware that, you know, I'm on too many pills. They don't all suit me. 
and I'm worried about falling or I'm worried about brain failure, they're the ones who will talk to the doctor and say, hey, look, you know, I'm worried about all this. Uh, let's have a look about what's going on. So there's nothing, there's nothing um, uh, about me thinking the way I think that has come from me. It's just a bunch of strong women in my life and, uh, you know, who've kind of marked my card about what's really going on. I love that answer. That is definitely uh, the most unique answer and the most relatable to me because I definitely mark myself as a strong woman, you know, mm -hmm. I had to be to get through all this. But um, so do you want to leave us with any closing thoughts? You said so much good stuff. I feel like I could talk to you for another hour, at least, you, you know, just more in depth about group think um, any of the topics or anything that you're passionate about. Do you want to talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one little thing um, you have to mention. Um, I've got a blog. It's davidhealy.org. And if you go on that, there's a thing we just opened up there called Politics of Care. OK, and care means two things. One is there's um, you know, the women mostly who are doing underpaid or low paid jobs in big residential homes and things like that. Uh, and it's rough work uh, and things like that. And there's the politics about low pay there that are pretty important. The other angle with care, though, is care is about speaking up about things going wrong. It's taking your courage in your hands uh, and saying, look, this is going wrong for my child or my parent or me or whatever. It's speaking up to a doctor when doctors are scary. That's what's involved in care. So that's the other thing that you know, the politics of care is all about. But what it's trying to do, and again, it needs a lot of people listening in here and other people, to, to, I mean, what I think is going on is we've got a crisis in healthcare, which is like the climate change crisis, okay? The earth is heating up, but equally in healthcare, life expectancy is falling. And this is linked to us being on too many drugs. This isn't saying we should be on no drugs, but we can't be on too many drugs. We've got to stop ending up on all of the drugs we're on at the moment. And this is, you know, what, what, I'd what I think we need to do is to recognize that the same things that are driving climate change are what are changing the climate of healthcare. And if we can understand one, well, if we can understand what happens to us in healthcare, if we can understand how to stop doctors putting us on too many drugs, how to speak up when we need to speak up, we can sort a lot more problems other than just healthcare, we can sort climate change also. I love that. I'm going to check that out as soon as we hang up. Um, so just thank you again from our community for all the work you do, for all the awareness you spread, for the books you write, everything, for just being open-minded and talking about this in general. Like, I don't think, I can't think of another person who talks about sexual dysfunction at all. Like you're the first person that always comes to mind. So just thank you. Thank you from all, from all of us. Okay. So uh, great talking to you. Um, lastly, where can every where can everybody find you besides the blog? Can you uh, uh, risk risk dot org is um, is um, one of you know, the key places. And the other thing is uh, there's a book lately which came out called Shipwreck of the Singular, which tells people everything they need to know about me and where I think healthcare has come from and where it's going wrong. Perfect. All right. Thank you everybody for joining us today. If you haven't seen the film Medicating Normal yet. Go check it out on our website is medicatingnormal.com. There's a watch page. If you go follow it, you'll see our upcoming screenings. Um, this video will be recorded and will be on YouTube in two weeks. So we do post new interviews, screenings. Actually today, David Healy's episode when he was a panel for us on the UK sobriety films. I always say that wrong. Sobriety films UK. When he was on that panel, you can go watch that panel and binge watch David Healy today if you'd like to. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, and we add more screenings all the time. We add more interviews. An interview coming up next week is Dr. Roger McFillin. He's a board certified psychologist calling attention to uh, diagnostic and pharmaceutical harm. And if you have any ideas that you like to hear, any guests that you are dying to, to hear or ask questions of, please just feel free to email us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. Thank you, David. You're all awesome. Better. If I can ever be of help, in the future, let me know. I just, I'm a fan of your work. I'm probably gonna binge read all of your books <laughs> so, well, as soon as my reading capability can kind of come back a little bit, but you've just been great guests. I just admire everything you say. Right. Thank you. Okay, see you. All right, bye-bye. Have, have a good day, everyone.